Section 9 of Folklore and Legends Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. The Magician with the Swine's Head. When the son of the Chan had, as before, seized upon Sidi, and was carrying him away, Sidi spoke as formerly, but the son of the Chan shook his head, without uttering a word, and Sidi began the following relation. A long while since there lived in a happy country a man and a woman. The man had many bad qualities, and cared for nothing but eating, drinking, and sleeping. At last his wife said unto him, By thy mode of life thou hast wasted all thine inheritance. Arise thee then from thy bed, and while I am in the fields, go you out and look about you. As he therefore, according to these words, was looking about him, he saw a multitude of people pass behind the pagoda with their herds, and birds, foxes, and dogs crowding and noising together around a particular spot. Thither he went, and there found a bladder of butter. So he took it home and placed it upon the shelf. When his wife returned and saw the bladder of butter upon the shelf, she asked, where found you this bladder of butter? To this he replied, I did according to your word, and found this. Then said the woman, Thou went out for but an instant, and hast already found thus much. Then the man determined to display his abilities, and said, Procure me then a horse, some clothes, and a bloodhound. The wife provided them accordingly, and the man taken with him, besides these his bow, cap, and mantle, seated himself on horseback, let the hound in a leash, and rode forth at random. After he had crossed over several rivers, he spied a fox. Ah, thought he, that would serve my wife for a cap. So saying, he pursued the fox, and when it fled into a hamster hole, the man got off his horse, placed his bow, arrows, and clothes upon the saddle, fastened the bloodhound to the bridle, and covered the mouth of the hole with his cap. The next thing he did was to take a large stone, and hammer over the hole with it. This frightened the fox, which ran out and fled with the cap upon its head. The hound followed the fox, and drew the horse along with it, so that they both vanished in an instant, and the man was left without any clothes. After he had turned back a long way, he reached the country of a mighty Chan, entered the Chan's stable, and concealed himself in a stack of hay, so that merely his eyes were left uncovered. Not long afterwards, the beloved of the Chan was walking out, and wishing to look at a private horse. She approached close to the hay rick, placed the talisman of life of the Chan's kingdom upon the ground, left it there, and returned back to the palace without recollecting it. The man saw the wonderful stone, but was too lazy to pick it up. At sunset the cows came by, and the stone was beating into the ground. Some time afterwards a servant came and cleansed the place, and the wonderful stone was cast aside upon a heap. On the following day the people were informed by the beating of the kettle drums that the beloved of the Chan had lost the wonderful stone. At the same time all the magicians and soothsayers and interpreters of science were summoned and questioned upon the subject. On hearing this the man in the hayrick crept out as far as his breast, and when the people thronged around him and asked, What hast thou learned? he replied, I am a magician. On hearing these words they exclaimed, Because the wondrous stone of the Chan is missing, all the magicians in the country are summoned to appear before him. Do you then draw an eye unto the Chan? The man said, I have no clothes. Hereupon the whole crowd hastened to the Chan, and announced unto him thus, In the hayrick there lieth a magician who has no clothes. This magician would draw an eye unto you, but he has not to appear in. The Chan said, Send unto him this robe of cloth, and let him approach. It was done. The man was fetched, and after he had bowed down to the Chan, he was asked what he needed for the performance of his magic charms. To this question he replied, For the performance of my magic charms, it is needful that I should have the head of a swine, some cloths of five colors, and some baling, a sacred figure of dough or paste. When all these things were prepared, the magician deposited the swine's head at the foot of a tree, dressed it with the cloths of five colors, fastened on the large baling, 
and passed the whole of three nights in meditation. On the day appointed, all the people assembled, and the magician, having put on a great durga, a cloak, placed himself with the swine's head in his hand in the street. When they were all assembled together, the magician, showing the swine's head, said, Here not, and there not. All were gladdened at hearing these words. Because therefore, said the magician, the wonderful stone is not to be found among the people. We must seek for it elsewhere. With these words, the magician, still holding the swine's head in his hand, drew nigh unto the palace, and the Chan and his attendants followed him, singing songs of rejoicing. When at last the magician arrived at the heap, he stood suddenly still and exclaimed, There lies the wonderful stone. Then, first removing some of the earth, he drew forth the stone and cleansed it. Thou art a mighty magician, joyfully exclaimed all who beheld it. Thou art the master of magic with the swine's head. Lift up thyself that thou mayest receive thy reward. The chan said, Thy reward shall be whatsoever thou wilt. The magician, who thought only of the property he had lost, said, Give unto me a horse with saddle and bridle, a bow and arrows, a cap, a mantle, a hound and a fox. Such things give unto me. At these words the chan exclaimed, Give him all that he desireth. This was done, and the magician returned home with all that he desired, and with two elephants, one carrying meat and the other butter. His wife met him close to his dwelling, with brandy for him to drink, and said, Now indeed thou art become a mighty man. Thereupon they went into the house, and when they had laid themselves down to sleep, the wife said unto him, where hast thou found so much flesh and so much butter? Then her husband related to her circumstantially the whole affair, and she answered him, saying, Verily, thou art a stupid ass. Tomorrow I will go with a letter to the Chan. The wife accordingly wrote a letter, and in the letter were the following words. Because it was known unto me that the lost wondrous stone retained some evil influence over the Chan, I have, for the obviating of that influence, desired of him the dog and the fox. What I may receive for my reward depends upon the pleasure of the Chan. The Chan read the letter through, and sent costly presents to the magician, and the magician lived pleasantly and happily. Now in a neighboring country there dwelt seven Chans, brethren. Once upon a time they betook themselves, for pastime, to an extensive forest, and there they discovered a beautiful maiden with a buffalo, and they asked, what are you two doing here? Whence come you? The maiden answered, I come from an eastern country, and am the daughter of a Chan. This buffalo accompanies me. At these words these others replied, We are the seven brethren of a Chan, and have no wife. Will thou be our wife? Note. It is in accordance with the customs of Tibet for a woman of that country to have several husbands. The maiden answered, so be it. But the maiden and the buffalo were two mangush, a species of evil spirit, like Shumnu, and were seeking out men whom they might devour. The male mangush was a buffalo, and the female, she who became wife to the brethren. After the mangush had slain yearly one of the brethren of the Chan, there was only one remaining. And because he was suffering from grievous sickness, the ministers consulted together and said, for the sickness of the other Chans we have tried all means of cure, and yet have found no help, neither do we in this case know what to advise. But the magician with the swine's head dwells only two mountains off from us, and he is held in great estimation. Let us, without further delay, send for him to our assistance. Upon this four mounted passengers were dispatched for the magician, and when they arrived at his dwelling they made known to him the object of their mission. I will, said the magician, consider of this matter in the course of the night, and will tell you in the morning what is to be done. During the night he related to his wife what was required of him, and his wife said, You are looked upon, up to this time, as a magician of extraordinary skill, but from this time there is an end to your reputation. However, it cannot be helped, so go you must. 
On the following morning the magician said to the messengers, During the night time I have pondered upon this matter, and a good omen has presented itself to me in a dream. Let me not tarry any longer, but ride forth today. The magician thereupon equipped himself in a large cloak, bound his hair together on the crown of his head, carried in his left hand the rosary, and in his right hand the swine's head, enveloped in the clouds of five colors. When in this guise he presented himself before the dwelling place of the Chan, the two Mangush were sorely frightened, and thought to themselves, This man has quite the appearance, quite the countenance, of a man of learning. Then the magician, first placing a bailing on the pillow of the bed, lifted up the swine's head, and muttered certain magic words. The wife of the Chan, seeing this, discontinued tormenting the soul of the Chan, and fled in all haste out of the room. The Chan, by this conduct being freed from the pains of sickness, sank into a sound sleep. "'What's this?' exclaimed the magician, filled with affright. "'The disease has grown worse. The sick man uttereth not a sound. The sick man hath departed.' Thus thinking, he cried, "'Chan! Chan!' But because the Chan uttered no sound, the magician seized the swine's head, vanished through the door, and entered the treasure chamber. No sooner had he done so than thief, thief, sounded in his ears, and the magician fled into the kitchen, but the cry of stop that thief, stop that thief, still followed him. Thus pursued, the magician thought to himself, this night it is of no use to think of getting away, so I will therefore conceal myself in a corner of the stable. Thus thinking, he opened the door, and there found a buffalo that lay there as if wearied with a long journey. The magician took the swine's head and struck the buffalo three times between the horns, whereupon the buffalo sprang up and fled like the wind. But the magician followed after the buffalo, and when he approached the spot where he was, he heard the male magoon say to his female companion, Yonder magician knew that I was in the stable. With his frightful swine's head he struck me three blows, so that it was time for me to escape from him. And the chan's wife replied, I too am so afraid, because of his great knowledge, that I will not willingly return. For of a certainty things will go badly with us. Tomorrow he will gather together the men with weapons and arms, and will say unto the women, Bring hither firing. When this is done, he will say, Lead the buffalo hither. And when thou appearest, he will say unto thee, Put off the form thou hast assumed. And because all resistance would be useless, the people perceiving thy true shape will fall upon thee with swords and spears and stones, and when they have put thee to death, they will consume thee with fire. At last the magician will cause me to be dragged forth and consumed with fire. Oh, but I am sore afraid. When the magician heard these words, he said to himself, After this fashion may the thing be easily accomplished. Upon this he betook himself with the swine's head to the chan, lifted up the bailing, murmured his words of magic, and asked, How is it now with the sickness of the Chan? And the Chan replied, Upon the arrival of the master of magic, the sickness passed away, and I have slept soundly. Then the magician spake as follows, Tomorrow, then, give this command to thy ministers, that they collect the whole of the people together, and that the women be desired to bring fire with them. When in obedience to these directions there were two lofty piles of faggots gathered together, the magician said, Place my saddle upon the buffalo. Then the magician rode upon the saddled buffalo three times round the assembled people, then removed the saddle from the buffalo, smote it three times with the swine's head, and said, Put off the form thou hast assumed. At these words the buffalo was transformed into a fearful, ugly mangush. His eyes were bloodshot, his upper tusks descended to his breast, his bottom tusks reached up to his eyelashes, so that he was fearful to behold. When the people had hewed this mangush to pieces with sword and with arrow, with spear and with stone, and his body was consumed upon one of the piles of faggots, then said the magician, Bring forth the wife of the Chan. And with loud cries did the wife of the Chan come forth. And the magician smote her with the swine's head and said, Appear in thine own form. Immediately her long tusks and bloodshot eyes exhibited the terrific figure of a female mangush. After the wife of the Chan had been cut in pieces and consumed by fire, the magician mounted his horse, but the people bowed themselves before him and strewed grain over him, 
presented him with gifts, and regaled him so on every side, so that he was only enabled to reach the palace of the Chan on the following morning. Then spake the Chan, full of joy, to the magician, How can I reward you for the great deed that thou hast done? And the magician answered, In our country there are but few no-sticks for oxen to be found. Give me, I pray you, some of these no-sticks. Thus spake he, and the Chan had him conducted home with three sacks of no-sticks, and seven elephants bearing meat and butter. Near unto his dwelling his wife came with brandy to meet him, and when she beheld the elephants she exclaimed, Now indeed thou art become a mighty man. Then they betook themselves to their house, and at night-time the wife of the magician asked them, How camest thou to be presented with such gifts? The magician replied, I have cured the sickness of the Chan, and consumed with fire two mangush. At these words she replied, Verily, thou hast behaved very foolishly, after such a beneficial act, to desire nothing but no sticks for cattle. Tomorrow I myself will go to the Chan. On the morrow the wife drew near unto the Chan, and presented unto him a letter from the magician, and in this letter stood the following words. Because the magician was aware that of the great evil of the Chang a lesser evil still remained behind, he desired of him the no sticks. What he is to receive as a reward depends upon the pleasure of the Chan. He is right, replied the Chan, and he summoned the magician, with his father and mother, and all his relations before him, and received them with every demonstration of honor. But for you I should have died. The kingdom would have been annihilated the ministers and all the people consumed as the food of the mangush. I, therefore, will honor thee. And he bestowed upon him proofs of his favor. Both man and wife were intelligent, exclaimed the son of the Chan. Rural of destiny, replied Sidi, thou hast spoken words, sad while I mistook Jack Sang. Thus spake he, and burst from the sack through the air. Sidi's fourth relation treats of the magician with the head of the swine. End of section 9。section 10 folklore and legends oriental。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。folklore and legends oriental by charles john tibbets。THE HISTORY OF SUNSHINE AND HIS BROTHER As the Chan's son was journeying along as before, laden with Sidi, Sidi inquired of him as formerly who should tell a tale. But the son of the Chan shook his head without speaking a word, and Sidi began as follows. Many years ago, Kuchanas Chan reigned over a certain happy land. This Chan had a wife and a son, whose name was Sunshine, Rani Garal. Upon the death of his first wife, the Chan married a second, and by her likewise he had a son, and the name of his second son was Moonshine, Sarani Garal. And when both these sons were grown up, the wife of the Chan thought to herself, So long as Sunshine, the elder brother, lives, Moonshine, the younger, will never be Chan over this land. Sometime after this, the wife of the Chan fell sick, and tossed and tumbled about on her bed from the seeming agony she endured. And the Chan inquired of her, What can be done for you, my noble spouse? To these words the wife of the Chan replied, Even at the time I dwelt with my parents I was subject to this sickness, but now it has become past bearing. I know indeed but one way of removing it, and that way is so impracticable that there is nothing left for me but to die. Hereupon spake the Chan, Tell unto me this way of help, and though it should cost me half my kingdom, thou shalt have it. Tell me what thou requirest. Thus spake he, and his wife replied with the following words, If the heart of one of the Chan's sons were roasted in the fat of the Gunsa, a beast, but thou wilt not, of course, sacrifice sunshine for this purpose, and I myself bear moonshine, his heart I will not consume so that there is now nothing left for me but to die. The Chan replied, Of a surety Sunshine is my son, and inexpressibly dear to me. But in order that I may not lose thee, 
I will tomorrow deliver him over to the Yaragachi, the servants of justice. Moonshine overheard these words and hastened to his brother and said, Tomorrow they will murder thee. When he had related all the circumstances, the brother replied, Since it is so, to remain at home, honoring your father and mother, the time of my flight is come. Then said Moonshine with a troubled heart, Alone I will not remain, but I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Because the following day was appointed for the murder, the two brothers took a sack with baling cakes from the altar, crept out at night, for it was the night of the full moon, from the palace, and journeyed on day and night through the mountainous country, until they at length arrived at the course of a dried-up river. Because their provender was finished, and the river afforded no water, Moonshine fell to the earth utterly exhausted. Then spake the elder brother, full of affliction, I will go and seek water, but do you watch an instant until I come down from the high places. After some vain attempts, Sunshine returned, and found that his brother had departed this life. After he had with great tenderness covered the body of his brother with stones, he wandered over high mountains, and then arrived at the entrance of a cave. Within the cave sat an aged Archie. Whence comes thou? inquired the old man. Thy countenance betokens deep affliction. And when the youth had related all that had passed, the old man, taking with him the means of awakening the dead, went with the youth to the grave, and called Moonshine back to life. Will ye be unto me as sons? Thus spake the old man, and the two young men became as sons unto him. Not far from this place there reigned a mighty Chan of fearful power, and the time was approaching in this country when the fields were watered, but the crocodiles prevented this. The crocodiles frequented a marsh at the source of the river, and would not allow the water to stream forth until such times as the song of the tiger year had been offered to them as food. After a time it happened that when search had been made in vain for a son of the tiger year, certain people drew nigh unto the Chan, and said, Near unto the source of the river dwelleth the old Archie, and with him a son of the tiger year. Thither led we our cattle to drink, and we saw him. Note. Among the Kalmuks every year has its peculiar name, and persons born in any year are called the children of that year. When he heard this, the Chan said, Go and fetch him. Accordingly, the messengers were dispatched for him, and when they arrived at the entrance of the cave, the Archie himself came forth. "'What is it that ye seek here?' inquired the aged Archie. "'The Chan,' replied they, "'speakest to thee thus. Thou hast a son of the tiger year. My kingdom hath need of him. Send him unto me.' But the Archie said, "'Who could have told you so? Who, indeed, would dwell with an old Archie?' Thus speaking, he retired into his cave, closed the door after him, and concealed the youth in a stone chest, placed the lid on him, and cemented up the crevices with clay, as if it was from the distillation of a rack. But the messengers, having broken down the door, thrust themselves into the cave, searched it, and then said, Since he whom we sought is not here, we are determined that nothing shall be left in the cave. Thus speaking, they drew their swords, and the youth said, out of fear for the Archie, Hurt not, my father, I am here. And when the youth was come forth, the messengers took him with them, but the Archie they left behind them weeping and sorrowing. When the youth entered into the palace of the Chan, the daughter of the Chan beheld him, and loved him, and encircled his neck with her arms. But the attendants addressed the Chan, saying, Today is the day appointed for the casting of the son of the tiger year into the waters. Upon this the Chan said, Let him then be cast into the waters. But when they would have led him forth for that purpose, the daughter of the Chan spake and said, Cast him not into the waters, or cast me into the waters with him. And when the Chan heard these words, he was angered, and said, Because this maiden cares so little for the welfare of the kingdom, over which I am Chan, let her be bound fast unto the son of the tiger year, and let them be cast together into the waters. And the attendant said, It shall be according as you have commanded. 
But when the youth was bound fast, and with the maiden cast into the waters, he cried out, Since I am the son of the tiger year, it is certainly lawful for them to cast me into the waters. But why should this charming maiden die, who so loathed me? But the maiden said, Since I am but an unworthy creature, it is certainly lawful for them to cast me into the waters. But wherefore do they cast in this beauteous youth? Now the crocodiles heard these words, felt compassion, and placed the lovers once more upon the shore. And no sooner had this happened that the streams began to flow again. And when they were thus saved, the maiden said to the youth, Come with me, I pray you, unto the palace. And he replied, When I have sought out my father Archie, then I will come, and we will live together unsevered as man and wife. Accordingly the youth returned to the cave of the old Archie, and knocked at the door. I am thy son, said he. My son, replied the old man, has the chan taken and slain? Therefore it is that I sit here and weep. At these words the son replied, Of a verity I am thy son. The chan indeed bade them cast me into the waters, but because the crocodiles devoured me not, I am returned unto you. Weep not, O my father. Ashi then opened the door, but he had suffered his beard and the hair of his head to grow, so that he looked like a dead man. Sunshine washed him therefore with milk and with water, and aroused him by tender words from his great sorrow. Now when the maiden returned back again to the palace, the Chan and the whole people were exceedingly amazed. The crocodiles, they exclaimed, half contrary to their want, felt compassion for this maiden and spurred her. This is indeed a very wonder. So the whole people passed around the maiden, bowing themselves down before her. But the Chan said, That the maiden is returned is indeed very good, but the son of the tiger year is assuredly devoured. At these words his daughter replied unto him, The son of the tiger year surely is not devoured. On account of his goodness his life was spared him. And when she said this, all were more than ever surprised. Arise, said the Chan to his ministers. Lead this youth hither. Agreeably to these commands, the ministers hastened to the cave of the aged Archie. Both Archie and the youth arose, and when they approached unto the dwelling of the Chan, the Chan said, For the mighty benefits which this youth has conferred upon us, and upon our dominions, we feel ourselves bound to go forth and meet him. Thus spake he, and he went forth to meet the youth, and led him into the interior of the palace and placed them upon one of the seats appropriated to the nobles. O oh, thou most wondrous youth, he exclaimed, art thou indeed the son of Archie? The youth replied, I am the son of a Chan, but because my stepmother, out of the love she bare to her own son, sought to slay me, I fled, and accompanied by my younger brother, arrived at the cave of the aged Archie. When the son of the Chan related all this, the Chan loaded him with honours, and gave his daughters for wives unto the two brothers, and sent them with many costly gifts and a good retinue home to their own kingdom. Thither they went, drew nigh unto the palace, and wrote a letter as follows. To the Chan, their father, the two brothers had returned back again. Now the father and mother had for many years bewailed the loss of both their sons, and their sorrows had rendered them so gloomy that they remained ever alone. On receipt of this letter they sent forth a large body of people to meet their children. But because the wife of the Chan saw both the youths approaching with costly gifts and a goodly retinue, so great was her envy that she died. She was very justly served, exclaimed the son of the Chan. Ruler of destiny, thou hast spoken words, sad while a to jokes hang. Thus spake Sidi, and burst from the sack through the air. Thus Sidi's fifth relation, Tweets of Sunshine and his brother. End of section 10section 11 of folklore and legends oriental this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org folklore and legends oriental by charles john tibbets the wonderful man who overcame the chan 
when the son of the Chan had proceeded as formerly to seize the dead one, then spake he the threatening words, seized upon Sidi, thrust him into the sack, tied the sack fast, ate of the butter cakes, and journeyed forth with his burden. After Sidi had as before asked who should tell the tale, and the son of the Chan had replied by merely shaking his head, Sidi began the following relation. A long, long time ago there lived in the land of Barchis, a wild, high-spirited man, who would not allow any one to be above him. Then spake the Chan of the kingdom to him, full of displeasure, Away with thee, thou good-for-nothing one, away with thee to some other kingdom. Thus spake he, and the wild man departed forth out of the country. On his journey he arrived about midday at a forest, where he found the body of a horse, which had been somehow killed, and he accordingly cut off its head, fastened it to his girdle, and climbed up a tree. About midnight there assembled the host of Chatkurs, evil spirits, mounted upon horses of bark, wearing likewise caps of bark, and they placed themselves around the tree. Afterwards there assembled together other Chatkurs, mounted upon horses of paper, and having caps of paper on their heads, and they likewise placed themselves around a tree. During the time that those who were assembled were partaking of various choice wines and liquors, the man peeked anxiously down from the tree, and as he was doing so, the horse's head fell down from his belt. The Chatkurs were thereby exceedingly alarmed, so much that they fled hither and hither, uttering fearful cries. On the following morning the man descended from the tree and said, This night there was in this spot many choice viands and liquors, and now they are all vanished. And while he was thus speaking, he found a brandy flask, and as he was anxious for something to drink, he immediately applied the flask which he had found to his lips. When suddenly there sprang out of it meat and cakes and other delicacies fit for eating. This flask, cried he, is of a surety a wishing flask, which will procure him who has it everything he desires. I will take the flask with me. And when he had thus spoken, he continued his journey until he met with a man holding a sword in his hand. Wherefore, cried he, dost thou hold this hammer in thy hand? To this question the other replied, When I strike the earth nine times with this hammer, there immediately arises a wall of iron, nine pillars high. Then said the first, Let us make an exchange. And when the exchange was made, he cried out, Krishwinger, go forth and bring me back my golden vessel. After Krishwinger had slain the man, and brought back the golden vessel, the man journeyed on until he encountered another man, carrying in his bosom a sack made of goat skin, and he asked him, Wherefore keepest thou that sack? To this question the other replied, This sack is a very wonderful thing. When you shake it, it rains heavily, and if you shake it very hard, it rains very heavily. Hereupon the owner of the flask said, Let us change, and they changed accordingly, and the sword went forth, slew the man, and returned back to its master with the golden vessel. When the man found himself in the possession of all these wonderful things, he said unto himself, The Chan of my country is indeed a cruel man. Nevertheless, I will turn back unto my native land. When he had thus considered, he turned back again, and concealed himself in the neighborhood of the royal palace. About midnight he struck the earth nine times with his iron hammer, and there arose an iron wall nine pillars high. On the following morning the Chan arose and said, During the night I have heard a mighty talk talk at the back of the palace. Thereupon the wife of the Chan looked out and said, At the back of the palace there stands an iron wall nine pillars high. Thus spake she, and the Chan replied full of anger, The wild has spirited man has a surety erected this iron wall but we shall see whether he or I will be the conqueror. When he had spoken these words, the Chan commanded all the people to take fuel and bellows, and make the iron wall red-hot on every side. Thereupon there was an immense fire kindled, and the wonderful man found himself, with his mother, within the wall of iron. He was himself upon the upper pillars, but his mother was on the eighth. And because the heat first reached the mother, she exclaimed unto her son, the fires which the Chan have commanded the people to kindle will destroy the iron wall, and we shall both die. 
the son replied, Have no fear, mother, for I can find means to prevent it. When he had spoken these words, he shook the sack of goatskin, and there descended heavy rain and extinguished the fire. After that he shook the sack still more forcibly, and there arose around them a mighty sea, which carried away both the fuel and the bellows which the people had collected. Thus, then, the wonderful gained the mastery over the Chan, exclaimed the son of the Chan. Ruler of destiny, thou hast spoken words. Salwala well mistook Jackson. Thus spoke Sidi, and burst from the sack through the air. Thus Sidi's sixth relation treats of the wonderful man who overpowered the Chan. End of section 11 Section 12 of Folklore and Legends Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chris Edkins, Folklore and Legends Oriental, by John Tibbets, The Birdman. When the son of Chan had done as formerly, spoken the threatening words and carried off Sidi, Sidi asked him as before to tell a tale, but the son of Chan shook his head without speaking a word, and Sidi began as follows. In times gone by there lived in a fair country the father of a family, whose three daughters had daily by turns watched over the calves. Now it once happened during the time that the eldest sister should have been watching the calves that she fell asleep, and one of them was lost. When the maiden awoke and missed the calf, she arose and went forth to seek it, and wandered about until she reached a large house with a red door. She went in, and then came to a golden door, next to that was a silver one, and last of all to a brazen door. After she had likewise opened this door and found, close to the entrance of it, a cage decorated with gold and all manner of costly jewels, and within it, on a perch, there stood a white bird. I have lost a calf, said the maiden, and I am come hither to seek it. At these words the bird said, If thou wilt become my wife, I will find the calf for you, but not without. But the maiden said, That may not be. Among men birds are looked upon as wild creatures, therefore I will not become your wife, even though, through refusing, I lose the calf forever. And when she had thus spoken, she returned home again. On the following day the second sister went forth to tend the calves, and she likewise lost one of them. And it happened unto her as it had done unto the eldest sister, and she too refused to become the wife of the bird. At last the youngest sister went forth with the calves, and when she missed one she too wandered on until she reached the house wherein the bird resided. The bird said unto her likewise, If thou wilt become my wife, I will produce procure for thee the calf which thou hast lost. Be it according to thy will. Thus spake she, and became the wife of the bird. After some time it happened that a mighty thirteen-day feast was held at a large pagoda in the neighbourhood, and upon this occasion a number of persons assembled together, amongst the rest the wife of the bird. And she was the foremost among the women, but among the men the most noticed was an armed man who rode upon a white horse three times around the assemblage, and all who saw him exclaimed, He is the first. And when the woman returned home again, the white bird demanded of her, Who were the foremost among the men and the women who were there assembled together? Then said the woman, The foremost among the men was seated upon a white horse, but I knew him not. The foremost of the women was myself. And for eleven days did these things fall out, but on the twelfth day when the wife of the bird went to the assemblage, she sat herself down near an old woman. Who, said the old woman, is the first in the assemblage this day? To this question the wife of the bird replied, Among the men the rider upon the white horse is beyond all comparison the foremost, and among the women I myself am so. Would that I were bound unto this man, for my husband is numbered among wild creatures, since he is nothing but a bird. Thus spake she, weeping, and the old woman replied as follows, Speak ye no more words like unto these. Amongst the assembled women thou art in all things the foremost, but the rider upon the white horse is thine own husband. 
Tomorrow is the thirteenth day of the feast. Come not tomorrow unto the feast, but remain at home behind the door until thine husband opens his birdhouse, takes his steed from the stables, and rides to the feast. Take ye then the open birdhouse and burn it, and when thou hast done this, thy husband will remain henceforth for ever in his true form. The wife of the bird thereupon did as she had been told, and when the birdhouse was opened and her husband had departed, she took down the birdhouse and burned it upon the hearth. When the sun bowed down towards the west, the bird returned home and said to his wife, What, art thou already returned? And she said, I am already returned. Then said her husband, Where is my birdhouse? And the wife replied, I have burned it. And he said, Barama, that is a pretty business. The birdhouse was my soul. And his wife was troubled and said, What is now to be done? To these words the bird replied, There is nothing can be done now except that you seat yourself behind the door, and there by day and night keep clattering a sword. But if the clattering sword ceases, the chadkas will carry me away. Seven days and seven nights must you thus defend me from the chadkas and from the tangari. At these words the wife took the sword and propped open her eyelids with little sticks, and watched for the space of six nights. On the seventh night her eyelids closed for an instant, but in that instant the chadkas and the tangari suddenly snatched her husband away. Weeping bitterly and despising all nourishments, the distracted wife ran about everywhere, crying unceasingly, unceasingly, Alas, my bird husband! Alas, my bird husband! When she had sought for him day and night without finding him, she heard from the top of the mountain the voice of her husband. Following the sound, she discovered that the voice proceeded from the river. She ran on to the river and then discovered her husband with a load of tattered boots upon his back. Oh, my heart is greatly rejoiced, said the husband, at seeing thee once more. I am forced to draw water for the Chadkas and the Tangari, and I have worn out all these boots in doing so. If thou wishest to have me once again, build me a new birdhouse and dedicate it to my soul, then I shall come back again. With these words he vanished into the air, but the woman betook herself home to the house again and made a new birdhouse and dedicated it to the soul of her husband. At length the birdman appeared and perched himself on the roof of the house. Truly his wife was an excellent wife, exclaimed the son of Chan. Ruler of destiny, thou hast spoken words. Sawala, misdu, jakang. Thus spoke Sidi, and burst from the sack through the air. Thus Sidi's seventh relation treats of the birdman. End of section 12。Section 13 of Folklore and Legends, Oriental。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. The Painter and the Woodcarver. When the son of the Chan had, as on all the former occasions, spoken the words of threatening, placed the dead one in the sack, and drawn it forth with him, Sidi spake this time also as follows. The day is long, and the distant journey will tire us. Do you relate a tale unto me, or I will relate one unto you? But the son of the Chan shook his head without saying a word, and Sidi began as follows. Many years ago there lived in the land of Gujasmun a Chan, whose name was Gunis Chang. This Chan, however, died, and his son Chamuk Sakitshi was elected Chan in his place. Now there lived among the people of that country a painter and a woodcarver, who bore similar names and were evilly disposed towards each other. Once upon a time the painter, Gunga, drew nigh unto the Chan, and said unto him, Thy father hath been born into the kingdom of the Tangari, and hath said unto me, Come unto me. Thither I went, and found thy father in great power and splendor, and I have brought for you this letter from him. 
With these words the painter delivered unto the Chan a forged letter, the contents of which were as follows. This letter is addressed to my son, Chamuk Sakichji. When I departed this life, I was born to the kingdom of the Tangari. An abundance of all things reigns in this land. But since I am desirous of erecting a pagoda, and there are no woodcarvers to be found here, do you dispatch unto me, Gunga, the woodcarver? The means by which he is to reach this place he may learn from the painter. After he had perused this letter, the Chan of Gujasmun said, If my father has really been carried into the realms of the Tangari, that would indeed be a good thing. Call hither the woodcarver. The woodcarver was called, and appeared before the Chan, and the Chan said unto him, My father has been carried into the realms of the Tangari. He is desirous of erecting a pagoda, and because there are no woodcarvers there, he is desirous that you should be dispatched unto him. With these words the Chan displayed the forged letter, and when he had read it, the woodcarver said unto himself, Of a surety, Gonga the painter has played me this trick, but I will try if I cannot overreach him. Thus thinking, he inquired of the painter, By what means can I reach the kingdom of the Tangari? To these words the painter replied, When thou hast prepared all thy tools and implements of trade, then place thyself upon a pile of faggots. And when thou hast sung songs of rejoicing and set light to the pile of faggots, thus wilt thou be able to reach the kingdom of the Tangari. Thus spake he, and the seventh night from that time was appointed for the carver's setting forth on his journey. When the wood carver returned home unto his wife, he spake unto her these words, The painter hath conceived wickedness in his mind against me, yet I shall try means to overreach him. Accordingly, he secretly contrived a subterranean passage, which reached from his own house into the middle of his field. Over the aperture in the field he placed a large stone, covered the stone with earth, and when the seventh night was come, the Chan said, This night let the woodcarver draw nigh unto the Chan, my father. Thereupon, agreeably to the commands of the Chan, every one of the people brought out a handful of the fat of the gunsa, a beast. A huge fire was kindled, and the woodcutter, when he had sung the songs of rejoicing, escaped by the covered way he had made back to his own house. Meanwhile the painter was greatly rejoiced, and pointed upwards with his finger, and said, There rideth the woodcarver up to heaven. All who had been present to betook themselves home, thinking in their hearts, The woodcarver is dead, and gone up above to the Chan. The woodcarver remained concealed at home a whole month, and allowed no man to set eyes upon him, but washed his head in milk every day, and kept himself always in the shade. After that he put on a garment of white silk, and wrote a letter, in which stood the following words. This letter is addressed to my son, Chamuk Sakichti. That thou rulest the kingdom in peace, it is very good. Since thy woodcarver has completed his work, it is needful that he should be rewarded according to his deserts. Since, moreover, for the decoration of the pagoda, many colored paintings are necessary, send it on to me, the painter, as thou hast already sent this man. The woodcarver then drew nigh on to the Chan with this letter. What? cried the Chan. Art thou returned from the kingdom of the Tangari? The woodcarver handed the letter unto him and said, I have indeed been in the kingdom of the Tangari, and from it I am returned home again. The Chan was greatly rejoiced when he heard this, and rewarded the woodcarver with costly presents. Because the painter is now required, said the Chan, for the painting of the pagoda, let him now be called before me. The painter drew nigh accordingly, and when he saw the woodcarver, fair and in white shining robes, and decorated with gifts, he said unto himself, Then he is not dead. And the Chan handed over to the painter the forged letter, with the seal thereto, and said, Thou must go now. And when the seventh night from that time arrived, the people came forward as before with a contribution of the fat of the gunsa, and in the midst of the field a pile of faggots was kindled. The painter seated himself in the midst of the fire, with his materials for painting, and a letter and gifts of honor for the Chang Gunish Chang, and sang songs of rejoicing. And as the fire kept growing more and more intolerable, he lifted up his voice and uttered piercing cries. 
but the noise of the instruments overpowered his voice, and at length the fire had consumed him. "'He was properly rewarded,' exclaimed the son of the Chan. "'Ruler of destiny, thou hast spoken words. Salwala misdood Jexan. Thus spake Sidi, and burst from the sack through the air. Thus Sidi's eighth relation treats of the painter and the woodcarver. End of section 13 Section 14 of Folklore and Legend Oriental This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Pinchcliffe Of Folklore and Legend Oriental By Charles John Tibbets The Stealing of the Heart when the son of the Chan was, as formerly, carrying Sidi away in the sack, Sidi inquired of him as before. But the son of the Chan shook his head without speaking a word, so Sidi proceeded as follows. Many, many years ago, there ruled over a certain kingdom a Chan named Gugalokshi. Upon the death of this Chan, his son, who was of great reputation and worth, was elected Chan in his place. One baron, a measure of distance, from the residence of the Chan, dwelt a man who had a daughter of wonderful abilities and extraordinary beauty. The son of the Chan was enamoured of this maiden, and visited her daily, until, at length, he fell sick of a grievous malady, and died, without the maiden being aware of it. One night, just as the moon was rising, the maiden heard a knocking at the door. The face of the maiden was gladdened when she beheld the son of the Chan, and the maiden arose and went to meet him, and she led him in and placed a rack and cakes before him. Wife, said the son of the Chan, come with me. The maiden followed, and they kept going further and further, until they arrived at the dwelling of the Chan, from which proceeded the sound of cymbals and kettle drums. Chan, what is this? she asked. The son of the Chan replied to these inquiries of the maiden, Do you not know that they are now celebrating the feast of my funeral? Thus spake he. And the maiden replied, The feast of thy funeral? Has anything then befallen the Chan's son? And the son of the Chan replied, He is departed. Thou wilt however, bear a son unto him. And when the season is come, go into the stable of the elephant, and let him be born there. In the palace there will arise a contention betwixt my mother and her attendant, because of the wonderful stone of the kingdom. The wonderful stone lies under the table of sacrifice. After it has been discovered, do you and my mother reign over this kingdom until such time as my son comes of age? Thus spake he, and vanished into the air. But his beloved fell, from very anguish into a swoon. Chan, Chan! exclaimed she sorrowfully, when she came to herself again. And because she felt that the time was come, she betook herself to the stable of the elephants, and there gave birth to a son. Of the following morning, when the keeper of the elephants entered the stable, he exclaimed, What? Has a woman given birth to a son in the stable of the elephants? This has never happened before. This may be an injury to the elephants. At these words, the maiden said, Go unto the mother of the Chen, and say unto her, Arise, something wonderful has taken place. And when these words were told unto the mother of the chair, then she arose and went unto the stable, and the maiden related unto her all that had happened. Wonderful, said the mother of the chair. Otherwise the chair had left no successors. Let us go together into the house. Thus speaking, she took the maiden with her into the house, and nursed her, and tended her carefully. And because her account of the wonderful stone was found correct, all of the rest of her story was believed. So the mother of the Chan and his wife ruled over the kingdom. 
Henceforth, too, it happened that every month, on the night of the full moon, the deceased Chan appeared to his wife, remained with her until morning dawned, and then vanished into air. And the wife recounted this to his mother, but his mother believed her not, and said, This is a mere invention. If it were true, my son would, of a surety, show himself likewise unto me. If I am to believe your word, you must take care that mother and son meet one another. When the son of the Chan came on the night of the full moon, his wife said unto him, It is well that thou comest unto me on the night of every full moon, but it were yet better if thou comest every night. And as she spake thus, with tears in her eyes, the son of the Chan replied, If thou hast sufficient spirit to dare its accomplishment, thou mightest do what would bring me every night, but thou art young and cannot do it. Then, said she, if thou wilt but come every night, I will do all that is required of me, although I should thereby lose both flesh and bone. Thereupon the son of the Chan spake as follows, Then betake thyself on the night of the full moon, a baron from this place, to the iron old man, and give unto him a rack. A little further you will come unto two rams, to them you must offer Bagshimak cakes. A little further on, you will perceive a host of men in coats of mail and other armor, and there you must share out meat and cakes. From thence you must proceed to a large black building, stained with blood. The skin of a man floats over it instead of a flag. Two airlicks, friends, stand at the center. Present unto them both offerings of blood. Within the mansion thou wilt discover nine fearful exorcists and nine hearts upon a throne. Take me, take me, will the old hearts exclaim, and the ninth heart will cry out, Do not take me, but leave the old hearts, and take the fresh one, and run home with it without looking round. Much as the maiden was alarmed at the task to which she had been enjoined to perform, she set forth on the night of the next full moon, divided the offerings, and entered the house. Take me not, exclaimed the fresh heart, but the maiden seized the fresh heart and fled with it. The exorcists fled after her, and cried out to those who were watching, Stop the thief of the heart! And the two Ehrlich cried, We have received offerings of blood! Then each of the armed men cried out, Stop the thief! But the ram said, We have received Bashmirmak cake. Then they all called out to the iron old man, Stop the thief of the heart! But the old man said, I have received a rack from her, and shall not stop her. Thereupon the maiden journeyed on without fear, until she reached home, and she found upon entering the house the Chan's son, attired in festive garments. And the Chan's son drew nigh, and threw his arms about the neck of the maiden. The maiden behaved well indeed, exclaimed the son of the Chan. Ruler of destiny, thou hast spoken word, Shawala, Miss Du, Jack Zhang. Thus spake Sidi, and burst from the sack through the air. Thus, Sidi's ninth relation treats of the stealing of the heart. End of section 14section 15 of folklore and legends oriental this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by annie hill folklore and legends oriental by charles john tibbets the man and his wife when cd had been captured as before and was being carried away in the sack he inquired, as he had always done, as to telling a tale. But the son of the Chan shook his head without speaking a word, whereupon Sidi began the following relation. Many, many years since, there lived in the kingdom of Olmisong two brothers, and they were both married. Now the elder brother, 
and his wife were niggardly and envious while the younger brother was of quite a different disposition once upon a time the elder brother who had contrived to gather together abundance of riches gave a great feast and invited many people to partake of it when this was known the younger thought to himself although my elder brother has hitherto not treated me very well yet he will now no doubt since he has invited so many people to his feast invite also me and my wife this he certainly expected but yet he was not invited probably he thought my brother will summon me to-morrow morning to the brandy drinking because however he was not even invited unto that he grieved very sore and said unto himself this night when my brother's wife has drunk the brandy i will go unto the house and steal somewhat when however he had glided into the treasure chamber of his brother there lay the wife of his brother near her husband but presently she arose and went into the kitchen and cooked meat and sweet food and went out of the door with it the concealed one did not venture at this moment to steal anything but said unto himself before i steal anything i will just see what all this means so saying he went forth and followed the woman to a mountain where the dead were wont to be laid on the top upon a green mound lay a beautiful ornamental tomb over the body of a dead man this man had formerly been the lover of the woman even when afar off she called unto the dead man by name and when she had come unto him she threw her arms about his neck and the younger brother was nigh unto her and saw all that she did the woman next handed the sweet food which she had prepared to the dead man and because the teeth of the corpse did not open she separated them with a pair of brazen pincers and pushed the food into his mouth suddenly the pincers bounced back from the teeth of the dead man and snapped off the tip of the woman's nose while at the same time the teeth of the dead man closed together and bit off the end of the woman's tongue upon this the woman took up the dish with the food and went back to her home the younger brother thereupon followed her home and concealed himself in the treasure chamber and the wife laid herself down again by her husband presently the man began to move when the wife immediately cried out woe is me woe is me was there ever such a man and the man said what is the matter now the wife replied the point of my tongue and the tip of my nose both these thou hast bitten off what can a woman do without these two things to-morrow the chan shall be made acquainted with this conduct thus she spake and the younger brother fled from the treasure chamber without stealing anything on the following morning the woman presented herself before the chan and addressed him saying my husband has this night treated me shamefully whatsoever punishment may be awarded to him i myself will see it inflicted but the husband persisted in asserting of all this i know nothing because the complaint of the wife seemed well founded and the man could not exculpate himself the chan said because of his evil deeds let this man be burnt when the younger brother heard what had befallen the elder he went to see him and after the younger one had related to him all the affair he betook himself unto the chan saying that evil-doer may be really discovered let both the woman and her husband be summoned before you i will clear up the mystery when they were both present the younger brother related the wife's visit to the dead man and because the chan would not give credence unto his story he said in the mouth of the dead man you will find the end of the woman's tongue and the blood-soiled tip of her nose you will find in the pincers of brass send thither and see if it not be so thus spake he and people were sent to the place and confirmed all that he had asserted upon this the chan said since the matter stands thus let the woman be placed upon the pile of faggots and consumed with fire and the woman was placed upon the pile of faggots and consumed with fire that served her right said the son of chan 
ruler of destiny, thou hast spoken words. Swarala, Miss Dude, Jaxang. Thus spake Sidi, and burst from the sack through the air. Thus Sidi's tenth relation treats of the man and his wife. End of section 15. Section 16 of Folklore and Legends Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Farno Jahangiri. Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. Section 16 Of the Maiden Suwarandari. When the son of Chan was carrying off Sidi as formerly, Sidi related the following tale. A long while ago there was in the very center of a certain kingdom an old pagoda in which stood the image of Chochim Bodosita, a Mongolian idol, formed of clay. Near unto this pagoda stood a small house in which a beautiful maiden resided with her aged parents. But at the mouth of the river which ran thereby dwelt a poor man who maintained himself by selling fruit, which he carried in an ark upon the river. Now it happened once that as he was returning home he was benighted in the neighborhood of the pagoda. He listened at the door of the house in which the two old people dwelt, and heard the old woman say unto her husband, we are both grown exceedingly old could we now but provide for our daughter it would be well that we have lived so long happily together said the old man we are indebted to the talisman of our daughter let us however offer up sacrifice to bodosida and inquire of him to what condition we shall dedicate our daughter to the spiritual or to the worldly to-morrow at the earliest dawn we will therefore lay our offering before the bochan now know I what to do, said the listener. So in the night time he betook himself to the pagoda, made an opening in the back of the idol, and concealed himself therein. When on the following morning the two old people and the daughter drew nigh and made their offering, the father bowed himself to the earth and spake as follows. Deify Bodosida, shall this maiden be devoted to a spiritual or a worldly life? If she is to be devoted to a worldly life, vouchsafe to point out now or the hereafter in a dream or vision to whom we shall give her to wife. Then he who was concealed in the image exclaimed, It is better that thy daughter be devoted to a worldly life, therefore give her to wife to the first man who presents himself at thy door in the morning. The old people were greatly rejoiced when they heard these words, and they bowed themselves again and again down to the earth, and walked around the idol. On the following morning the man stepped out of the idol, and knocked at the door of the aged couple. The old woman went out, and when she saw that it was a man, she turned back again, and said to her husband, The words of the bookshan are fulfilled. The man has arrived. Give him entrance, said the old man. The man came in accordingly, and was welcomed with food and drink, and when they had told him all that the idol had said, he took the maiden with the talisman to wife. When he was wandering forth and drew nigh unto his dwelling, he thought unto himself, I have with cunning obtained the daughter of the two old people. Now I will place the maiden in the ark and conceal the ark in the sand. So he concealed the ark and went and said unto the people, Though I have ever acted properly, still it has never availed me yet. I will therefore now seek to obtain liberal gifts through my prayers. Thus spake he, and after repeating the Zoka prayers, part of the Kalmak ritual, he obtained food and gifts, and said, Tomorrow I will again wander about, repeat the appointed Zoka prayer, and seek food again. In the meanwhile it happened that the son of the Chan and two of his companions, with bows and arrows in their hands, who were following a tiger, passed by unnoticed, and arrived at the sand heap of the maiden Suwarandari. Let us shoot at the heap, cried they. Thus spake they, and shot accordingly, and lost their arrows in the sand. As they were looking after the arrows, they found the ark, opened it, and drew out the maiden with the talisman. Who art thou, maiden? inquired they. I am the daughter of Lu, the Chan's son said. Come with me and be my wife. And the maiden said, I cannot go unless another is placed in the ark instead of me. 
so they all said let us put in the tiger and when the tiger was placed in the ark the chen's son took away with him the maiden and the talisman returned in the meanwhile the beggar ended his prayers and when he had done so he thought unto himself if i take the talisman slay the maiden and sell the talisman of a surety i shall become rich indeed thus thinking he drew nigh unto the sand heap drew forth the ark carried it home with him and said unto his wife who he thought was within the ark i shall pass this night in repeating the zoka prayers he threw off his upper garment and when he had done so he lifted off the cover of the ark and said maiden be not alarmed when he was thus speaking he beheld the tiger when some persons went into the chamber on the following morning they found the tiger with his tusks and claws covered with blood and the body of the beggar torn into pieces and the wife of the chan gave birth to three sons and lived in the enjoyment of plenty of all things but the ministers and the people murmured and said it was not well of the chan that he drew forth his wife out of the earth although the wife of the chan has given birth to the sons of the chan still she is but a low-born creature thus spoke they and the wife of the chan received little joy therefrom i have borne three sons said she and yet am no ways regarded i will therefore return home to my parents she left the palace on the night of the full moon and reached the neighborhood of her parents at noontide where there had formerly been nothing to be seen she saw a multitude of workmen busily employed and among them a man having authority who prepared meat and drink for them who art thou maiden inquired this man i come far from hence replied the wife of the chan but my parents formerly resided upon this mountain and i have come hither to seek them at these words the young man said thou art then their daughter and he received for answer i am their daughter i am their son said he i have been told that i had a sister older than myself art thou she sit thee down partake of this meat and this drink and we will then go together unto our parents when the wife of the chan arrived at the summit of the mountain she found in the place where the old pagoda stood a number of splendid buildings with golden towers full of bells and the hut of her parents was changed into a lordly mansion all this said her brother belongs to us since you took your departure our parents lived here in health and peace in the palace there were horses and mules and costly furniture in abundance the father and mother were seated on rich pillows of silk and gave their daughter welcome saying thou art still well and happy that thou hast returned home before we depart from this life is of a surety very good after various inquiries had been made on both sides relative to what had transpired during the separation of the parties the old parents said let us make these things known unto the chan and his ministers so the chan and his ministers were loaded with presents and three nights afterwards they were welcomed with the meat and drink of the best but the chan said ye have spoken falsely the wife of the chan had no parents now the chan departed with his retinue and his wife said i will stop one more night with my parents and i then will return unto you on the following morning the wife of the chan found herself on a hard bed without pillows or coverlets what is this exclaimed she was i not this night with my father and mother and did i not retire to sleep on a bed of silk and when she rose up she beheld the ruined hut of her parents her father and mother were dead and their bones mouldered their heads lay upon a stone weeping loudly she said unto herself i will now look after the pagoda but she saw nothing but the ruins of the pagoda and of the poor chan a godly providence exclaimed she has resuscitated my parents now since the chan and the ministers will be pacified i will return home again on her arrival in the kingdom of her husband the ministers and the people came forth to meet her and walked around her this wife of the chan cried they is descended from noble parents has borne noble sons and is herself welcome pleasant and charming thus speaking they accompanied the wife of the chan to the palace her merits must have been great thus spake the son of the chan ruler of destiny thou hast spoken words swarwala misdu jejang 
thus spake Sidi, and burst from the sack through the air. Thus Sidi's eleventh relation treats of the maiden Suvarandari. End of section 16 Recording by Fano Jahangiri Section 17 of Folklore and Legends, Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Folklore and Legends, Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. Section 17. The Two Cats. In former days, there was an old woman who lived in a hut more confined than the minds of the ignorant and more dark than the tombs of misers her companion was a cat from the mirror of whose imagination the appearance of bread had never been reflected nor had she from friends or strangers ever heard its name it was enough that she now and then scented a mouse or observed the print of its feet on the floor when blessed by favouring stars or benignant fortune one fell into her claws she became like a beggar who discovers a treasure of gold her cheeks glowed with rapture and past grief was consumed by present joy this feast would last for a week or more and while enjoying it she was wont to exclaim am i o oh god when i contemplate this in a dream or awake am i to experience such prosperity after such adversity but as the dwelling of the old woman was in general the mansion of famine to this cat she was always complaining and forming extravagant and fanciful schemes one day when reduced to extreme weakness she with much exertion reached the top of the hut when there she observed a cat stalking on the wall of a neighbour's house which like a fierce tiger advanced with measured steps and was so loaded with flesh that she could hardly raise her feet the old woman's friend was amazed to see one of her own species so fat and sleek and broke out into the following exclamation your stately strides have brought you here at last pray tell me from whence you come from whence have you arrived with so lovely an appearance you look as if from the banquet of the khan of katai where have you acquired such a comeliness and how came you by that glorious strength the other answered i am the sultan's crumb-eater each morning when they spread their convivial table i attend at the palace and there exhibit my address and courage from among the rich meats and wheat cakes i cull a few choice morsels i then retire and pass my time till next day in delightful indolence the old dame's cat requested to know what rich meat was and what taste wheat cakes had as for me she added in a melancholy tone during my life i have neither eaten nor seen anything but the old woman's gruel and the flesh of mice the other smiling said this accounts for the difficulty i find in distinguishing you from a spider your shape and stature is such as must make the whole generation of cats blush and we must ever feel ashamed while you carry so miserable an appearance abroad you certainly have the ears and tail of a cat but in other respects you are a complete spider were you to see the sultan's palace and to smell his delicious viands most undoubtedly those withered bones would be restored you would receive new life you would come from behind the curtain of invisibility into the plane of observation when the perfume of his beloved passes over the tomb of a lover is it wonderful that his putrid bones should be reanimated the old woman's cat addressed the other in the most supplicating manner oh my sister she exclaimed have i not the sacred claims of a neighbour upon you are we not linked in the ties of kindred what prevents your giving a proof of friendship by taking me with you when next you visit the palace perhaps from your favour 
plenty may flow to me and from your patronage i may attain dignity and honour withdraw not from the friendship of the honourable abandon not the support of the elect the heart of the sultan's crumb-eater was melted by this pathetic address she promised her new friend should accompany her on the next visit to the palace the latter overjoyed went down immediately from the terrace and communicated every particular to the old woman who addressed her with the following counsel be not deceived my dearest friend with the worldly language you have listened to abandon not your corner of content for the cup of the covetous is only to be filled by the dust of the grave and the eye of cupidity and hope can only be closed by the needle of mortality and the thread of fate it is content that makes men rich mark this ye avaricious who traverse the world he neither knows nor pays adoration to his god who is dissatisfied with his condition and fortune but the expected feast had not taken such possession of poor puss's imagination that the medicinal counsel of the old woman was thrown away the good advice of all the world is like wind in a cage or water in a sieve when bestowed on the headstrong to conclude next day accompanied by her companion the half-starved cat hobbled to the sultan's palace before this unfortunate wretch came as it is decreed that the covetous shall be disappointed an extraordinary event had occurred and owing to her evil destiny the water of disappointment was poured on the flame of her immature ambition the case was this a whole legion of cats had the day before surrounded the feast and made so much noise that they disturbed the guests and in consequence the sultan had ordered that some archers armed with bows from tartary should on this day be concealed and that whatever cat advanced into the field of valour covered with the shield of audacity should on eating the first morsel be overtaken with their arrows the old dame's puss was not aware of this order the moment the flavour of the viands reached her she flew like an eagle to the place of her prey scarcely had the weight of a mouthful been placed in the scale to balance her hunger when a heart dividing arrow pierced her breast a stream of blood rushed from the wound she fled in dread of death after having exclaimed should i escape from this terrific archer i will be satisfied with my mouse and the miserable hut of my old mistress my soul rejects the honey if accompanied by the sting content with the most frugal fare is preferable End of section seventeen. section eighteen of folklore and legends oriental this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by annie hill folklore and legends oriental by charles john tibbets section eighteen legend of duramnath during the reign of a mighty raj named guda singh a celebrated and as it is now supposed deified priest or hati called duramnath came and in all the characteristic humility of his sect established a primitive and temporary resting-place within a few miles of the raja's residence at run near mandev he was accompanied by his adopted son gurib nath from this spot duramnath dispatched his son to seek for charitable contributions from the inhabitants of the town to this end guribnath made several visits but being unsuccessful and at the same time unwilling that his father should know of the want of liberality in the city he at each visit purchased food out of some limited funds of his own at length his little hoard failing on the sixth day he was obliged to confess the deceit he had practised duramnath on being acquainted with this became extremely vexed and vowed from that day all the raja's poutine cities should become desolate and ruined 
the tradition goes on to state that in due time these cities were destroyed durhamnath accompanied by his son left the neighbourhood and proceeded to denodur finding it a desirable place he determined on performing tupsi or penance for twelve years and chose the form of standing on his head on commencing to carry out this determination he dismissed his son who established his duty in the jungles about twenty miles to the northwest of bouge after durumnath had remained tupsi for twelve years he was visited by all the angels from heaven who besought him to rise to which he replied that if he did so the portion of the country on which his sight would first rest would become barren if villages they would disappear if woods or fields they would equally be destroyed the angels then told him to turn his head to the northeast where flowed the sea upon this he resumed his natural position and turning his head in the direction he was told opened his eyes when immediately the sea disappeared the stately ships became wrecks and their crews were destroyed leaving nothing behind but a barren unbroken desert known as the rune durhamnath too pure to remain on the earth partook of an immediate and glorious immortality being at once absorbed into the spiritual nature of the creating the finishing the indivisible all-pervading broom this self-imposed penance of durhamnath has shed a halo of sanctity around the hill of denodur and was doubtless the occasion of its having been selected as a fitting site for a jogi establishment the members of which it is probable were originally the attendants on a small temple that had been erected and which still remains on the highest point of the hill on the spot where the holy durmnath is said to have performed his painful tupsi end of section eighteen section nineteen of folklore and legends oriental this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. recording by Pano jahangiri folklore and legends oriental by charles john tibbets section nineteen the traveler's adventure it is related that a man mounted upon a camel in the course of travelling arrived at a place where others from the same caravan had lighted a fire before proceeding on their journey the fan-like wind breathing on the embers had produced a flame and the sparks flying over the jungle the dry wood had become ignited and the whole plain glowed like a bed of tulips in the midst of this was an enormous snake which encircled by the flames possessed no means of escape and was about to be brought like a fish or kebabbed like a partridge for the table blood oozed from its poison charged eyes and seeing the man and the camel it thus supplicated for assistance what if in kindness thou wilt save me thy pity loosen the knot with which my furs are entangled now the traveller was a good man and one who feared god when he heard the complaint of the snake and saw its pitiable condition he reasoned thus with himself this snake is indeed the enemy of man but being in trouble and perplexity it would be most commendable in me to drop the seed of compassion the fruit of which is prosperity in this world and exultation in the next thus convinced he fastened one of his saddle-bags to the end of his spear and extended it to the snake which delighted at escape entered the bag and was rescued from the flames the man then opening the mouth of the bag addressed it thus depart whither thou wilt but forget not to offer up thanksgiving for thy preservation henceforth seek the corner of retirement and cease to afflict mankind for they who do so are dishonest in this world and the next fear god distress no one this indeed is true salvation the snake replied o oh, young man hold thy peace for truly i will not depart until i have wounded both thee and this camel the man cried out but how is this have i not rendered thee a benefit 
Why then is such to be my recompense? On my part there was faithfulness. Why then this injustice upon thine? The snake said, True, thou hast shown mercy, but it was to an unworthy object. Thou knowest me to be an agent of injury to mankind. Consequently, when thou savedst me from destruction, thou subjects thyself to the same rule that applies to the punishment due for an evil act committed against a worthy object. Again, between the snake and man there is a long-standing enmity, and they who employ foresight hold it as a maxim of wisdom to bruise the head of an enemy. To thy security my destruction was necessary, but in showing mercy thou hast forfeited vigilance. It is now necessary that I should wound thee, that others may learn by thy example. The man cried, O oh, snake, call but in the council of justice, in what creed is it written, or what practice declares, that evil should be returned for good, or that the pleasure of conferring benefits should be returned by injury and affliction? The snake replied, Such is the practice amongst men, I act according to thy own decree. The same commodity of retribution I have purchased from thee I also sell. Buy for one moment that which thou sellst for years. In vain did the traveller entreat, the snake ever replying, I do but treat thee after the manner of men. This the man denied, but, said he, let us call witnesses. If thou prove thy assertion, I will yield to thy will. The snake, looking round, saw a cow, grazing at a distance, and said, Come, we will ask this cow the rights of the question. When they came up to the cow, the snake, opening its mouth, said, O oh, cow, what is the recompense for benefits received? The cow said, If thou ask me after the manner of men, the return of good is always evil. For instance, I was for a long time in the service of a farmer. Yearly I brought forth a calf. I supplied his house with milk and ghee. His sustenance and the life of his children depended upon me. When I became old, and no longer produced young, he ceased to shelter me and thrust me forth to die in a jungle. After finding forage and roaming at my ease, I grew fat, and my old master, seeing my plump condition, yesterday brought with him a butcher to whom he has sold me, and today is appointed for my slaughter. The snake said, Thou hast heard the cow, prepare to die quickly. The man cried, it is not lawful to decide a case on the evidence of one witness. Let us then call another. The snake looked about and saw a tree, leafless and bare, flinging up its wild branches to the sky. Let us, said it, appeal to this tree. They proceeded together to the tree, and the snake, opening its mouth, said, O oh, tree, what is the recompense for good? The tree said, Amongst men, for benefits are returned evil and injury. I will give you a proof of what I assert. I am a tree which, though growing on one leg in this sad waste, was once flourishing and green, performing service to every man. When any of the human race, overcome with heat and travel, came this way, they rested beneath my shade and stepped beneath my branches. When the weight of repose abandoned their eyelids, they cast up their eyes to me and said to each other, Yon twig would do well for an arrow, that branch would serve for a plough, and from the trunk of this tree what beautiful planks might be made. If they had an axe or a saw, they selected my branches and carried them away. Thus they, to whom I gave ease and rest, rewarded me only with pain and affliction. Whilst my care overshadows him in perplexity, he meditates only how best to root me up. Well, said the snake, here are two witnesses, therefore, from thy resolution, for I must wound thee. The man said, True, but the love of life is powerful, and while the strength remains, it is difficult to root the love of it from the heart. Call but one more witness, and then I pledge myself to submit to his decree. Now it so wonderfully happened that the fox who had been standing by had heard all the arguments, and now came forward. The snake on seeing it exclaimed, Behold this fox! Let us ask it! But before the man could speak, the fox cried out, Dost thou not know that the recompense for good is always evil? 
but what good hast thou done in behalf of this snake to render thee worthy of punishment the man related his story the fox replied thou seemest an intelligent person why then dost thou tell me an untruth how can it be proper for him that is wise to speak falsely how can it become an intelligent man to state an untruth the snake said the man speaks truly for behold the bag in which he rescued me the fox putting on the garb of astonishment said how can i believe this thing how could a large snake such as thou be contained in so small a space the snake said if thou doubt me i will again enter the bag to prove it the fox said truly if i saw thee there i could believe it and afterwards settle the dispute between thee and this man on this the traveller opened the bag and the snake annoyed at the disbelief of the fox entered it which observing the fox cried out o oh, young man when thou hast caught thine enemy show him no quarter when an enemy is vanquished and in thy power it is the maxim of the wise to show him no mercy the traveller took the hint of the fox fastened the mouth of the bag and dashing it against the stone destroyed the snake and thus saved mankind from the evil effects of its wicked propensities End of section 19. Recording by Farno Jahangiri. Section 20 of Folklore and Legends Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Farno Jahangiri. Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets Section 20 The Seven Stages of Rustam Persia was at peace and prosperous, but its king Kekawus could never remain at rest. A favorite singer gave him one day an animated account of the beauties of the neighboring kingdom of Mazandaran, its ever-blooming roses, its melodious nightingales, its verdant plains, its mountains shaded with lofty trees and adorned to their summits with flowers which perfume the air, its clear murmuring rivulets, and above all its lovely damsels and valiant warriors all these were described to the sovereign in such glowing colors that he quite lost his reason and declared he should never be happy till his power extended over a country so favored by nature it was in vain that his wisest ministers and most attached nobles dissuaded him from so hazardous an enterprise as that of invading a region which had besides other defenders a number of thieves or demons who acting under their renowned chief diva safid or the white demon had hitherto defeated all enemies kekavus would not listen to his nobles who in despair sent for old zal the father of rostam and prince of sistan zal came and used all his efforts but in vain the monarch was involved in clouds of pride and closed the discussion he had with Zal by exclaiming, The creator of the world is my friend, the chief of the thieves is my prey. This impious boasting satisfied Zal he could do no good, and he even refused to become regent of Persia in the absence of Kekavus, but promised to aid with his counsel. The king departed to anticipate it conquest but the prince of mazandaran summoned his forces and above all the diva safid and his band they came at his call a great battle ensued in which the persians were completely defeated kekabus was made prisoner and confined in a strong fortress under the guard of a hundred thieves commanded by arjeng who was instructed to ask the persian monarch every morning how he liked the roses nightingales flowers trees verdant meadows shady mountains clear streams beautiful damsels and valiant warriors of mazandaran the news of this disaster soon spread over persia and notwithstanding the disgust of old zal at the headstrong folly of his monarch he was deeply afflicted at the tale of his misfortune and disgrace he sent for rostam to whom he said go my son and with thy single arm and thy good horse Rech, release our sovereign rostam instantly obeyed there were two roads but he chose the nearest though it was reported to be by far the most difficult and dangerous 
Fatigued with his first day's journey, Rostam lay down to sleep, having turned Rekh loose to graze in the neighboring meadow, where he was attacked by a furious lion. But this wonderful horse, after a short contest, struck his antagonist to the ground with a blow from his forehoof, and completed the victory by seizing the throat of the royal animal with his teeth. When Rostam awoke, he was surprised and enraged. He desired Rekh never again to attempt unaided such an encounter. Hadst thou been slain, asked he of the intelligence brute, how should I have accomplished my enterprise? At the second stage, Rustam had nearly died of thirst, but his prayers to the Almighty were heard. A fawn appeared as if to be his guide, and following it he was conducted to a clear fountain where, after regaling on the flesh of a wild ass which he had killed with his bow, he lay down to sleep. In the middle of the night a monstrous serpent, seventy yards in length, came out of its hiding place and made at the hero who was awakened by the neighing of Rech. but the serpent had crept back to his hiding place and rostam seeing no danger abused his faithful horse for disturbing his repose another attempt of the serpent was defeated in the same way but as the monster had begun concealed itself rostam lost all patience with Rech, whom he threatened to put to death if he again awakened him by any such unseasonable noises the faithful steed fearing his master's rage but strong in his attachment instead of neighing when the serpent again made his appearance sprang upon it and commenced a furious contest rostam hearing the noise started up and joined in the combat the serpent darted at him but he avoided it and while his noble horse seized their enemy by the back the hero cut off its head with his sword when the serpent was slain, Rostam contemplated its enormous size with amazement, and with that piety which always distinguished him, returned thanks to the Almighty for his miraculous escape. Next day, as Rostam sat by a fountain, he saw a beautiful damsel regaling herself with wine. He approached her, accepting her invitation to partake of the beverage, and clasped her in his arms as if she had been an angel. It happened, in the course of their conversation, that the Persian hero mentioned the name of the great god he adored. At the sound of that sacred word, the fair features and shape of the female changed, and she became black, ugly, and deformed. The astonished Rostam seized her, and after binding her hands, bid her declare who she was. I am a sorceress, was the reply, and have been employed by the evil spirit Ahraman for thy destruction, but save my life, and I am powerful to do this service. I make no compact with the devil or his agent, said the hero, and cut her in twain. He again poured forth his soul in thanksgiving to God for his deliverance. On his fourth stage, Rostam lost his way. While wandering about, he came to a clear rivulet, on the banks of which he lay down to take some repose, having first turned Rech loose into a field of grain. A gardener who had charge of it came and awoke the hero, telling him in an insolent tone that he would soon suffer for his temerity as the field in which his horse was feeding belonged to a pahlavan or warrior called Ulad. Rustam, always irascible, but particularly so when disturbed in his slumbers, jumped up, tore off the gardener's ears, and gave him a blow with his fist that broke his nose and teeth. Take these marks of my temper to your master, he said, and tell him to come here and he shall have a similar welcome. Ulad, when informed of what had passed, was excited to fury and prepared to assail the Persian hero who, expecting him, had put on his armor and mounted Rech. His appearance so dismayed Ulad that he dared not venture on the combat till he had summoned his adherents. They all fell upon Rostam at once, but the base-born Caitiffs were scattered like chaff before the wind. Many were slain, others fled among whom was their chief. Him Rostam came up with at the fifth stage, and having thrown his noose over him, took him prisoner. Ulad, in order to save his life, not only gave him full information of the place where his sovereign was confined and of the strength of the Diva Safid, but offered to give the hero every aid in the accomplishment of his perilous enterprise. This offer was accepted, and he proved the most useful auxiliary. On the sixth day, they saw in the distance the city of Mazandran, near which the Diva Safid resided. 
Two chieftains with numerous attendants met them, and one had the audacity to ride up to Rostam and seize him by the belt. The chief's fury at this insolence was unbounded. He disdained, however, to use his arms against such an enemy, but seizing the miscreant's head, wrenched it from the body and hurled it at his companions, who fled in terror and dismay at this terrible proof of the hero's prowess. Rustam proceeded after this action with his guide to the castle where the king was confined. The thieves were, who guarded it were asleep, and Kekawus was found in a solitary cell chained to the ground. He recognized Rustam, and bursting into tears, pressed his deliverers to his bosom. Rustam immediately began to knock off his chains. The noise occasioned by this awoke the thieves, whose leader, Bedareng, advanced to seize Rustam. But the appearance and threats of the latter so overawed him that he consented to purchase his own safety by the instant release of the Persian king and all his followers. After this achievement, Rostam proceeded to the last and greatest of his labors, the attack of the Divas of Fid. Ula told him that the Divas watched and feasted during the night, but slept during the heat of the day, hating, according to our narrator, the sunbeam. Rustam, as he advanced, saw an immense army drawn out. He thought it better before he attacked them to refresh himself by some repose. Having laid himself down, he soon fell into a sound sleep, and at daylight he awoke quite refreshed. As soon as the sun became warm, he rushed into the camp. The heavy blows of his mace soon awoke the surprised and slumbering guards of the Diyosafid. They collected in myriads, hoping to impede his progress, but all in vain. The rout became general, and none escaped but those who fled from the field of battle. When this army was dispersed, Rostam went in search of the Divas of Fid, who, ignorant of the fate of his followers, slumbered in the recess of a cavern, the entrance to which looked so dark and gloomy that the Persian hero hesitated whether he should advance. But the noise of his approach had roused his enemy, who came forth clothed in complete armor, his appearance was terrible, but Rostam, recommending his soul to God, struck a desperate blow which separated the leg of the thief from its body. This would on common occasions have terminated the contest, but far different was the result on the present. Irritated to madness by the loss of a limb, the master seized his enemy in his arms and endeavored to throw him down. The struggle was for some time doubtful, but Rostam, collecting all his strength, by a wondrous effort dashed his foe to the ground and seizing him by one of the horns unsheathed his dagger and stabbed him to the heart the divasafid instantly expired and rostam on looking round to the entrance of the cavern from whence the moment before he had seen numberless thieves issuing to the aid of their lord perceived they were all dead Ulad, who stood at a prudent distance from the scene of combat now advanced and informed the hero that the lives of all the thieves depended upon that of their chief when he was slain the spell which created and preserved this band was broken and they all expired rostam found little difficulty after these seven days of toil of danger and of glory in compelling mazandran to submit to persia the king of the country was slain and olad was appointed his governor as a reward for his fidelity the success of his arms had raised Kekabus to the very plenitude of power. Not only men, but thieves, obeyed his mandates. The latter he employed in building palaces of crystal, emeralds, and rubies, till at last they became quite tired of their toil and abject condition. They sought, therefore, to destroy him, and to effect this they consulted with the devil, who, to forward the object, instructed the thief called the Shrim to go to Kekavus and raise in his mind a passion for astronomy and to promise him a nearer view of the celestial bodies than had ever yet been enjoyed by mortal eyes. The deer fulfilled his commission with such success that the king became quite wild with a desire to attain perfection in this sublime science. The devil then instructed the Shrim to train some young vultures to carry a throne upwards, this was done by placing spears round the throne on the points of which pieces of flesh were fixed in view of the vultures who were fastened at the bottom. These voracious bears, in their efforts to reach the meat, raised the throne. Though he mounted rapidly for a short time, the vultures became exhausted and finding their efforts to reach the meat hopeless, discontinued them. This altered the direction 
and the equilibrium of the machine, and it tossed to and fro. Kekavus would have been cast headlong and killed had he not clung to it. The vultures, not being able to disengage themselves, flew an immense way and at last landed the affrighted monarch in one of the woods of China. Armies marched in every direction to discover and release the sovereign who, it was believed, had again fallen into the hands of the thieves. He was at last found and restored to his capital. Rostam, we are told, upbraided his folly, saying, Have you managed your affairs so well on earth that you must needs try your hand in those of heaven? End of section 20 Recording by Farnajahangiri